for coming. Some of you may think that you're here to hear a presentation about bees. Um, and I hope that we're not too disappointing, but apparently the bee thing will happen next month. But uh, we're here today uh, to have a conversation as a community. This is one of three or four conversations we've organized in Brookfield um, in concert with town administrators, Clarence in particular, uh, and the regional planning agency uh, around what the ta how the town should think about and prioritize its actions around its open space. There's lots of abundant open space. And um, we're going to tell you a lot more about how the structure of tonight will go in a couple minutes. But I just wanted to say welcome and introduce ourselves and, and see who's in the room. So my name is Sarah, and I'm working here with the Massachusetts Office of Public Collaboration. And we provide services to towns, um, to help with public decision making. My name is Meta Kreitzman, Meta, and I work for the Mass Office of Public Collaboration and doing this project with Sarah. So, so we we thank you. First names. Yeah, just two first oh, names. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. do the inner circle and then we'll do the outer circle. Um, and we'll are we introducing them. ourselves? So. Um, just, yeah, just, just first, first names. Hi, right. I'm Bill. Yeah, I'm Mark. Mark. I'm Lou. I'm Bill. Cindy. Mary. Don. Jim. James. Rosie. Hi, I'm Melissa, and I work for the State Environmental Offices. Hi, I'm Kwame Tran with Central Mass Regional Planning Commission, CMRPC. I'm Eli Goldman, also with Central Mass Regional Planning Commission. I'm Clarence, and you're a local selectman. Thank you. All right, um, so just a, a quick thought on what's going to happen today. So. Um, we have some snacks, the, the ca coffee is half-calf, um, and um, so feel free to get up and during the dialogue just get up and, and, and help yourselves. Most of you, if not all of you, know where the bathrooms are, but for us not local, it's out in the hallway. Um, we plan to be here today till about 8.30, no longer, uh, longer than 8.30, we might get a little early depending on how we're doing. Um, a little bit on the handouts that were on your chairs, um, there should be three sheets. The first one is sort of a, a, a multi-page. It's, it's what we refer to as a discussion guide that we will go through. The second page is supplemental information, and we might not need to go to that, but it could be that there's we're talking about something where we go, we're missing some information. So we have some information about the state's role in local open space and recreation, and Melissa can also talk more about that. We have um, some next steps about what's going to happen as next steps together with CMRPC. Then a little bit about how Brookfield's land is classified as open space, the uh, ag preservation restriction, and on the next page, conservation restriction, DFG dams, and we also have some materials from uh, Bill Davis was here last, uh, yeah, last time, the first two times, he couldn't make it today, Chapter 61 lands and Community Preservation Act. So this is just referral if we need to get to it. The final one is a questionnaire. It's a two-page, double-sided. We have pens uh, up on the table if you don't have one. We ask very much that you fill this out at the end and give it to us. If you have to leave early, which we hope you won't, but if something comes up, please take a few minutes to fill it out and just uh, come up and give it to us or leave it under your seat or something so we know to pick it up so we capture your... And the pens or pencils somewhere, right? They're also up on that table right okay. there, and I put a whole step there. Um, so... First, we'll start um, leaving with a brief introduction of the discussion guide that we're going to go through, um, a sort of a quick warm-up question, and then we'll explore each of the three approaches um, in detail. We'll end with some reflections of where we, what we've heard today and some next steps on that, potentially, and then the questionnaire. Um, so this dialogue is one in a series that we've been doing, and. Um, it's because Brookfield's open space and recreation plan expired last year and it's being re revised here this um, uh, spring. And the plan itself, the open space and recreation plan, it sort of charts a course for how Brookfield wants to invest in its community landscape, so uh, including how to manage, um, support and enhance the quality of the natural habitat around here, the rich agricultural heritage and the many, many outdoor recreation opportunities um, that are in here. Um, the Open Space and Recreation Open Plan also opened doors to funding to implement the plan um, and the action items that go into that plan. Um, and the plan itself really impacts the town in many ways that affect everybody. 
So it sort of it includes it can affect the character of the town, the quality of life, and also the viability of living here and working in Brookfield. Um, the purpose of the dialogues that we have been doing is sort of to hear what matters to people, what uh, to articulate sort of as a community uh, the key interests that are here and the priorities that should be looked at, um, and how people feel about trade-offs. Um, that you need to face because often resources are limited and some ideas that you might have might not sort of be compatible to do and then you have to make choices on those. Um, now the purpose tonight is not to really dive into the actual detailed plan itself. We are going to hopefully sketch out some of that, but not the details. Of, that's coming later with CMRPC um, and the Open Space and Recreation Committee. Um, I think that's yeah. it for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the way that we're going to structure tonight's conversation is using this discussion guide that's in your laps that we put together with a team of people from Brookfield um, and a few people from state agencies that, that represent some of the state interests in Brookfield open space. And um, we did a community survey that some of you may have participated in to start getting a feel of what are the conversations that people need to have on this issue, what really matters to people and what concerns them in town. And coming out of that, we formed tonight's discussion guide to make sure that we're actually talking about things that do matter to people. The central question that we'll be addressing is how should Brookfield use its natural areas and its recreation areas to honor its character and ensure sustainability as a community? We, uh, one of the things that we realized, and that is always the case when there's a, a diverse community in play, is, is there's a broad range of opinions about how to answer this question, how Brookfield should approach its open space in order to honor its character. Brookfield, everybody knows that Brookfield does have abundant open space, forests, lakes, ponds, uh, and people definitely use these areas to hunt and fish, and boat and hike. Um, and there were a number of people. Hi. We would love to invite you into the circle. Yeah, oh. come, come right yeah. around. Well, don't don't yeah. be shy. These are sort of. Um, I'm not from town, so I'm just very chill out. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Colin Novick from Worcester. Great. Welcome. Are you here for bees or are you here for? Something else. This is not bees? No. Nope. So that's bees why I is next month. Good. Yeah. Is this the burial ground? No. This is this is going to be open space, which includes the burial ground. If you need to know something about that, we will talk about that at some point. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I can share some documents with you before you leave. Beautiful. All right. Well, the bee talk was supposed to be tonight, right? Yes. So, so he yeah. knows he's not off yeah. if that's yeah. what he was coming yeah. to. <laughs> there was a rescheduling, yes. Yeah, so we apologize for that. Yeah. Uh, so, so one sentiment that we heard was that some people feel that what the plan, the open space plan really should do was prioritize keeping the natural areas in town as pristine as possible to maintain their integrity as, as natural areas. Um, and they, these people can possibly accept that in order to do that, there may need to be more regulation and there may need to be stricter enforcement of the regulation on how these lands can be used. There were other people who felt that what the plan really should do is enhance access to use the open space and the natural areas that are here, to do more recreating and more, and more human use of those, and enhance them with trails and signs and information and make them more inviting, make them safer, put de devote resources into their upkeep and their maintenance. And they recognize this may compromise some of the real pristine nature of them, and it may also require quite a bit of resources that have to come from somewhere, possibly from somewhere else that also matters. And then there are other people who feel that neither keeping the open space in a pristine condition nor inviting a lot of recreation on it, neither of those would really do enough to help uh, increase the tax base in town and make sure that it keeps it, it's maintained as a livable community where people can live here and work here, find jobs here, and continue to find farming viable here. 
And these people feel that what the open space plan should do is think about how to leverage the town's natural areas to increase tourism, agritourism, ecotourism, enhance markets for farming products, and possibly identify um, more areas in town for commercial development even though these people may recognize that that may change the feel and character of the town a little bit. So there, the idea for tonight's dialogue is to think about each of these mindsets for a set period of time and look at what might be good about the plan really taking that particular priority and what might be a challenge about that. What are, what are some of the trade-offs that would come along with any of these ways of approaching open space in town. And how do you feel about those trade-offs? To listen to each other's views, to explore your own views, and to talk about each one of these. So that's what Meta mentioned when she said we're gonna be going through each of the three approaches tonight. Some, sometimes it's tempting to say, you know, everything sounds good. We should keep them in pristine condition. We should uh, uh, maximize access and use of these lands, and we should leverage them as much as possible for, for dollars and revenue. Um, but if you really dig in, it's not necessarily possible to do all of those things, and it's certainly not possible to prioritize all of them at the same time. There, they, there are trade-offs among them. So we want to keep you honest and make sure that you really think through what some of those are um, so that the town can make some hard decisions in a very informed way based on what the community really feels about those trade-offs. So what Meta and I will be doing um, is capturing the themes of what comes out of tonight's discussion. And if there are questions that people still feel need to be answered through further research or discussions, we'll be capturing that too. And we'll be capturing how people feel about the trade-offs with some of the hard choices involved. And we're going to um, turn that into a summary report. Um, every comment uh, that's made here will, will still remain anonymous. Nobody, no, no comments or ideas are going to be attributed to individuals. But the report will summarize what the themes were that were, we heard. And then that report will be delivered to the town and to the regional planning agency who will work together to actually develop the plan itself. That will have a much greater level of detail than these conversations will have. And there will be some more opportunity for community input in that process as well. Um, do you want to mention a couple of those opportunities as part of the plan development later in the spring? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so as part of our process in updating the open space plan, we'll take um, the feedback to the data that was gathered as part of this process to inform how we approach the community-wide survey that we'll be putting together. And that'll be an opportunity for you folks to um, dig a little bit deeper into your concerns that were expressed in that initial survey. Um, it'll be a lot longer, um, a lot more detailed and broken down to recreation, um, passive recreation, active, and um, accessibility, things of that nature. So then after that, we'll have a public forum of some sort and display the survey results and talk about the goals and actions that um, we should work on to um, you know, get there. So, and then Melissa will review the plan from there, so. Can I say a word about that then, Melissa? Uh, yeah, so all um, communities that have, had, uh, have an open space and recreation plan in the Commonwealth, I reviewed them all, and there's a set of uh, uh, requirements for each plan, so I review them, make sure that the, the plan in includes all those required elements and uh, if the town writes an action plan that's for seven years, it'll be good for seven years, the plan will be in, and then the town is eligible for a few different open space grant opportunities through my office. So the grants that help acquire conservation land, recreation land, you can build parks, you can renovate existing parks, work on trails, that sort of thing. Any questions so far? What other surrounding towns are involved in this program? I mean, is North Brookfield doing something? Is Sturbridge doing something? Is East Brookfield? You know, are the towns that are around us, are they also looking into this? Do uh, I know? So Depend on their schedule, when their mm -hmm. plan, potentially if they have one, and if it expired or is still in, in its seven year, or oh, however long I guess it could be, but maybe you know more about that. Um, well, currently, CMRPC, <coughs> we're working with the town of Sturbridge to update their plan. Okay. Uh, the town of Millville, uh, Grafton is wrapping up their plan right now. I think we're just about done there. Um, I think those are all. Yeah, also, Charlton and West Boylston are wrapping up as well. So, 
a number of towns. Uh, from a unique perspective, having you come and provide the dialogue is a twist and something new right. in being able to do this because what, what would have happened in the past is we would have dusted off old and throw, thrown it across to you and say, hey, close enough. What we've had the opportunity with you coming from uh, Boston to, to help us facilitate this is we're actually digging down into what the town truly wants. Yeah, so this, this dialogue format is not necessarily what the other towns are using, probably not, because we're inventing it as we go. <laughs> uh, but but uh, the, the question of what are the surrounding towns doing is important, though. I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's part of the plan, just to see what, you know, Northwest and East Brookfield are, you know, if we make a plan that says one thing and they're just saying, all saying the exact opposite, that may be an issue. From a regional perspective. Yeah, I, yeah. Mean, I mean, just because I mean, just our our land goes into their land and, you know, the, yeah. the, they're dealing with the same Audubon properties and mass, fi mass fishing games, so. Yeah, I will say from a review of the OSRP standpoint, um, plans are supposed to take in, well, at least review what other cities and towns that abut them, what what their uh, plans mention. Okay, so that will, this, the intention is for that to be part of the process at some point? Yeah, part of the writing of the plan process. Correct. Yeah. Good question. All right, so um, Sarah, and I, <coughs> Sarah and I are going to work as sort of facilitators um, to or moderate the dialogue. And we are impartial about the issues that we are talking about today. Our role is also to be time, time, timekeepers. So um, we have to, even if there's very good conversation around one approach, we might need to just move you along so we get to the second one and the third one as well. Um, we will give some questions here and there in order to sort of help you deliberate and also not just give your opinion, but also dig a little deeper in that and what we call deliberation of, of looking at what are some of the challenges on that and can we live with those challenges, what we call trade-offs in that sense. Um, this is your discussion, so we hope that you will talk to each other and sort of we will fade into the background um, as well. That's what we're our hope for outcome in that sense. Um, we're also note-takers, so we will be starting to chart um, on the flip chart when we get started. and. Um, we're, as, as Sarah said, we're just going to capture the essence of what you say um, and we're not going to attribute anything to name and if there's a point where we're not sure how do we best capture, we might just say, can you help us just make sure that we get it right. Um, so we might do that. We usually have what we call dialogue guidelines, even though you can't see that up here. Um, so basically it's that we are going to have, um, that we have in order to have a good productive conversation, we invite these rules if you want, or guidelines to it. So have a fair consideration of each approach um, so that even if you might say this is something that I lean more towards versus the others, then give it some thought um, and, and include the benefits and the drawbacks. We ask that you step out of your comfort zone, so if you are a little bit on the talkative side, we invite you to say what you have to say, but also <coughs> pull it back and listen a little bit more. Or if you're on the quiet side, we invite you to come forward and talk more. Um, it's okay to disagree, we just ask that you do so uh, respectfully. Sometimes words come out wrong, but everybody here is here because they were here for the bees, <laughs> <laughs> or because they love Brookfield, in that sense, so both of those go hand in hand. So just think about that, if things come out wrong, is that everybody's coming from the same place of loving Brookfield, um, and therefore best intention is behind what comes out in most cases. Um, Share your ideas. What we're presenting in the three approaches, those are, I just like, think of them as a starting point. Share your ideas, but we also ask that you don't go too much off topic because then time has a way of running away from us. Um, and then final guideline is please remember to hand in because that's part of the data as well. Um, does that seem to work for everybody? Anybody have questions? Right. So, um, I'm just going to have to see. So, um, so what we'd like to do is just sort of start off with a question about um, what do you like or value about Brookfield right now? So hold off what you might would like to change and just think about what's here now around the open space and recreation around Brookfield. What do you love or value? And just speak up as you don't have to raise your hand or anything. Well, being a person involved in agriculture, we do have really good agricultural soils here. We're very blessed to have that. And uh, 
the whole, uh, you know, from North Pond all the way down, well, you go over to South Pond too, <clears throat> down the Quaybog, I mean, that's really a really unique uh, space, really. And most towns, you know, don't even come close to having something like that. Mm -hmm. But I, that's what uh, I think really stands out. We have Elm Hill on the other side of town. I mean, there was, that's where Elsie the Cow came from. I mean, that's a another really unique historical place and still a pretty well preserved farm thanks to the autobahn and the fellow that's running that running it now the center i think he's doing a great job and um just it's it's nice that the town really hasn't become spoiled like some of the towns that you head towards boston really i mean it's still still fairly rural which is really nice mm -hmm. and i wouldn't like it i wouldn't like to see it so to speak get wrecked I mean, I guess that's my opinion of everything in a nutshell. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of what we have to offer is really not known to people. Sometimes people come this way, come to Brookfield and say, wow, I never knew it was so beautiful here. It's like, it's almost like this town doesn't sort of exist, you know what I mean, to a lot of people. So that's my opinion. Sure. <laughs> Anybody, Anybody else? Anybody else who mm -hmm. want to share something that they love or value about Brookfield as it is right now? Well, do you want to share the map and why it's 50% underwater? We could. We could also use the map as we go along. What do you think? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's come back to that when we're talking about stuff a little more specific, unless you wanted to turn well, that into a comment comments. of your own. Yeah, yeah. yeah comment, because yeah. what you have up there in green is wildlife. What you have in orange is Elm Hill that Mark was talking about. And then the, the slashes that you see in, in black are APR related. And what you end up with when you start talking wildlife, Elm Hill, APR, you're dealing with 50% or more actually of property in Brookfield that is open space that we need to consider what we're supposed to be doing. And unfortunately, even some of the people that I know that work for the Autobahn kind of can't figure out why the Autobahn never really has done much with it with Elm Hill, you know what I mean? They say, it's kind of odd, you know what I mean? It's such a beautiful place, but it's just kind of... We haven't been, promoted it Yeah, it's been all. kind of pushed off into <laughs> on the side or whatever. They want their birds. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What is APR? It's preserving. It, it, with being some of us being agricultural related, what we have is a ben benefit if we were put putting our land into APR such that we could um, have a tax benefit. Well, what does APR stand for? And you got agricultural Protection. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. One more time in perfect unison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. All right. So why don't we move on to, if you flip the, the, the issue guide, to page two, what we're going to do now is just focus solely on um, approach one. So, yeah, called Protect Brookfield's Unspoiled Character. As if this were the emphasis of the plan. Right. So, this approach places, so I'm just going to read the top paragraph for you. Um, it places high value on the unspoiled character and rural feel of the community its intact natural habitats, and Brookfield's cultural heritage. The emphasis is on preserving natural spaces and the rural character of the town, protecting and restoring the environmental health of the ecosystems, limiting noise pollution and environmental impact from overuse and development, and increasing a sense of connection to wilderness. So some of the potential actions to consider is protecting our natural areas through improved regulation and enforcement, managing the natural and recreation areas for long-term sustainability, educating the community on how and why Brookfield should protect their natural areas. Some trade-offs um, to consider around this is that by doing this, there might be a lack of tax revenue coming in from protected lands. Um, which might increase the limit on economic development. And restrictions of certain land uses could also feel like an impingement on your personal freedom. And those are just, again, um, just a high note of the, um, the discussion guys was listed here. So what we'd like to do is just 
take a minute to just look at some of the actions listed under each of, of these um, suggestions and examples of that so that you can sort of wrap your head around what we mean by each. And if you could all just look up when you've looked at it so I get a sense of when everybody's ready. But if you take a minute just to take a look at this and also the trade-offs. Tell where to go with this approach. What's appealing about keeping Brookfield's unspoiled spaces unspoiled? Well, with, one of the things that jumps out at me is the uh, fines and enforcement for littering. That's just a pet peeve of mine, but. Mine too. Yeah. yeah. All right. Littering. Okay, okay. Who, who here likes littering? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Read my article as we built. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so. Clarence, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, enforcement, enforcement. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, happening. So, so, can I raise a point about that? Though? There's a cost to enforcement, though, and the taxes in this town are already high for the level of services we receive. So, if you want to, again, it's a double-edged sword. You want to move forward with enforcement? There's a cost. You got to look at that. I think one of the underlying issues, if you have to weigh a trade-off between economic development and open space, and that's one of the concerns I have. All right. So, what's appealing about keeping things up? I don't think there's anything appealing about it. Okay. Anybody else? Well, then I'll share the other side of the coin. So Bill Davis, District Manager for Wildlife, was here for two sessions and shared with his, with, with the group. The uh, second time that he visited us, he went down to South Pond and he went off to the Wildlife uh, Wolf Swamp parking area where someone had deposited 38 tires, trash. <laughs> So it would be very nice to know who did that and what we ought to be doing with that individual so that those kinds of things don't happen again. And since the state found that problem, how come the state didn't deal with it? It was dealt with. It was dealt with by the state? Yeah. Okay, good. Let them handle it. Well, I think there's a larger problem, but we'll leave it at that. So, but literally, it's a pet peeve of mine. And also uh, on that, though, let's not have any rules, and we go out and pick up a lot of trash and like, it's also a trade off on that because on that day it all just goes to our transfer station which is a cost that um, for that and so if there was no fines or regulations on the littering then maybe so many people wouldn't be just throwing stuff out there when it was around their cars and um, expect the towns people to just pick it up and take care of it. I don't think you'd have to weigh the cost benefit. I don't think, I don't. And again, I'd have to look at a study of it, but I'm not convinced it would really deter it. But. But littering that has names on the envelopes can be enforced. Well, that could be. By well. a simple letter from the Board of Health. So at a cost of 50 cents. But then if they refuse to comply, then you've got to take them to court. Could I, could I suggest that we check back in about one of the guidelines, or at least the principles of this dialogue. We're not actually here to persuade each other. In this particular format, we want to hear the range of opinions, and we want people to speak for themselves. But I guess it's I'm putting it back out to you if people are in agreement here that the best use of our time might not be to try to persuade each other of our points of views, 
but to hear them until we feel that they've been captured and then allow other people to state theirs. So we'll, if people, if I see a nod of heads that that's a good rule, then we'll try to hold people accountable to that here. Okay. So, so on the, someone behind me, I can't see if there's a hand raised behind me. But on the other thing that's sort of the, the, the drawback to the unspoiled character approach is, is restricting access, because um, right now we're, we're pretty restricted and I, we don't have a lot of leverage with a mass fishing game. Um, in terms of setting up trails or anything, but you can go out there and walk, but you can't make a trail. I mean, if you walk there enough times, it becomes a trail. But um, it's sort of, if we go strictly by their guidelines, we've got how many acres that were, it's really designated purely for hunting or for, you know, cutting illegal trails through. So. And, you, and you're stating that that's a concern of yours about this yep. approach. The concern is, yeah, if, if we, if we Restrict from them. Just keep it unspoiled, then we lose access, or at least, or there's less access. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think sort of the way things are sort of restricted here is people just kind of don't know about them. <laughs> it's not, I mean, anybody can go walking on the Autobahn land, really, but nobody, I don't think anybody really knows about yeah. it, kind of, you know what I mean? Well, Wolf Swamp, or, you know, it's just, I don't think there's anybody standing there saying, "Don't come on my gun, don't come on this land," right? Yeah. No. But we could, we could it, push them in that direction. Nothing's promoted. You see what I mean? We don't promote anything here. Well, I should take that back now. Uh, on the twenty-second, we're actually going to have the Blue Trail guys. Oh, really? And the Blue Trail guys. Oh, that's are promoting right. That's a map. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. We, we are promoting at least the Blue Trail stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'd like to just back us up a little bit so that um, we will get to concerns around this approach, but I'd just like to just give another minute to, if the town were to prioritize this approach, what aspects of it would be most beneficial? Well, the protection of the, I, I keep thinking the guy talking here, but the protection of the the resources is key. I mean, we run into issues with uh, Quebog and uh, the, the water coming into that system from, from other towns and further advocation and working together to keep the resources clean is a good thing. Anybody else? Can you think of people who might not be in the room who might find that this could be beneficial to them and what might they be thinking would be beneficial? We well, are basically talking status quo is what you're talking. Scenic beauty. Scenic beauty. As someone from outside town, I drive here to go canoeing. Mm. I drive a long way to come here to canoe. Yeah. Come back on the 22nd. <laughs> Get your map. <laughs> you need a calendar. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be kind of interesting to to, uh, to quantitate the the amount of people in town that actually enjoy any of these open spaces. Really, and I I don't think it's a lot of people myself. <laughs> I'll trade you a number. So since since uh, sitting on the board, we have permits that are requested for the use of the ponds for fishing tournaments. We are now counting over a thousand. A thousand? Mm -hmm. Just for the tournaments. But is that from out of town? It's account? either car, depending on what, the, what they fill in the blank, yeah. it's either cars or people, and we're mm -hmm. blocking on over a thousand. But is that just from Brookfield or? or Who? No, it's, it's out of yeah. town. Yeah. Out of town? Right, no, I know. Yeah, that. and that's the issue, Clarence. I'm yeah. pitching 90% of those permits are from out of town. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, totally. And it's an issue, totally. So I mean, yeah, right. Well, it isn't to the citizens of Brookfield. Mm -hmm. Right. So given that a lot of people from out of time want to come here, and, and should Brookfield pursue it's like a, a regional reputation for its high quality natural areas and landscapes? Well, I, I, think, it, I think it could improve the economy, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get it in each of the sessions that we've had is we don't even have a decent coffee shop on right now. No, you're right. Come out three times, so 
It's not come out a fourth time. <laughs> Nor a pizza shop, no bar. There you go. Any thoughts on that it should pursue a regional reputation for its pristine and natural beauties? Well, there's pros and cons there. If we advertise it and it's, the town is marketed in that way, then that opens up opportunities for those who are coming in to use the lakes, to use facilities if, they, if there's businesses that open up to serve that population. Um, the, the con is the more people using the resources, the more crowded they become. So. And we have a beach that gets mighty a little crowded. Anybody else? So you mentioned education before, um, that people just don't know a lot. Should more effort be put into educating people about how and why of protecting the environment and protecting the lands and what goes into that? It's a slightly different slant than what well, you were I saying. Well, I think it goes both that. ways because I don't think a lot of people really know what we really have out there, but then when they, if they do know and seem to start appreciating that, then they'll have to know how to properly um, visit them, I guess I'd put it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, that is a tricky thing, it's because there's a lot of green areas, but very few people know what the various rules are on accessing those areas. You know, right. we, we look it up because if it abuts our property, we're like, hey, how do we go walk over there? Right. Yeah. Connecting. Yeah. You know, I see I see a mass wildlife sign, I have to look it up. But. Right. So that's one of the actions and examples of, of, of what this approach is also is sort of putting up more signs explaining what activities are allowed and are not allowed and how you can use it and how you can connect and access. I see nodding at least from this side over here. Well you see a lot of that in other towns. I mean, I stopped at a place, uh, I don't know, it was technically uh, like between Hubbardston and, uh, and Barry, and it was, um, I think it was the uh, like Ware River watershed. And I mean, they did a great job there. They had great signage and, and the trail was really nice and explained what you could do, what you couldn't do, some historic uh, aspects of the trail. And it was great. Yep. But we don't have any of that here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, coming back to some of this surface before, but um, there might be more. So, if, if the town prioritized this approach, um, what concerns would you have? Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> no, it's, it's all on the sheet already. You know, that we we lose access because of restrictions. And the cost of maintaining restrictions is a piece of it. Um, we don't really have the opportunity. To to develop a lot of our, our open yeah. space, it's all because there, it is pretty well locked down. Fifty percent or yeah. more is on the water. Is that what you meant when you said cost associated with restrictions? You're just restating it as the last opportunity for development, uh, or another cost? I guess there's there's different things. There's if in terms of enforcement and stuff, there is some cost of policing. If we want to get into the more in depth in the littering and the um, uh, regulating, okay. um, but there's also there's well there's really regardless of, we don't really have a lot of say one way or the other in terms of developing a lot of our open space right now because it's all pretty well restricted or wet. Yeah. The additional is we don't have water outside the village. There's sewer, so you can't develop most of the land. I mean, so economic development <clears throat> is really limited in the town because of lack of sewer and lack of water outside the village. So concerns about rampant commercial development is really not going to happen.
That what depends, I'm, though, with, that depends on whether you're talking about <coughs> development in a concentrated area or development in terms of subdivisions. Subdivisions can be put up without sewer. That's true, but again, if you look where I live, you're supposed to have two acres per house. That limits your subdivision. And unlike Sturbridge, where you have, I mean, if you had sewer, you could put a house on every quarter of an acre. Not if it's a cluster development. If it's a cluster development, you can group the houses closer together That's and smaller. True. Yeah. And that does free up more open space, but it's still part of the property. It would be nice if we had some commercial um, stuff on Route 9, you know, such as the gables and, you know, things like that, places for people to go to, you know, to come to town, to go hiking and then be able to go out to lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too bad that we can't get those places going. I mean, I don't know what the problem is with that or even old Carmela's, you know, it's too bad that we don't have anything. Like you said, like the coffee shop, I mean, there's nothing to... You know, if we could get those places up and running, that would give tax revenue to the town, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. People would come and, you know, like I say, go hiking or whatever and, right. and, stay and go to the right. restaurant after, whatever. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll that one mm -hmm. further in mm -hmm. these two other um, mm -hmm. approaches as well. Um, so, you mentioned in the beginning that more protection often comes with more restrictions and more enforcement and stuff like that. Um, would people here and here, would, that, would they tolerate this? Would they accept that that's a natural thing in order to keep the environment pristine and keep the water quality and have all that? Would that be something that people could accept? Well, what's the, I mean, Jim mentioned cost benefit, but I mean, if, if if Brookfield became a town that was known for having, you know, very little littering, or we found a way to, you know, just that's just that's a marketing point you can make. You know, you can say, hey, come to Brookfield, it's clean. Yeah. You know, that, that that makes you special. <laughs> or don't do anything wrong in Brookfield, or they'll get you. Oh, that's the other thing. That's yeah. The, yeah. You know, yeah. Other than yeah. Yeah. I have concerns you'll get it. I don't think you'll get it to town meeting. I'm sorry. You won't get it to town meeting. Uh, yeah. Um, let me just yes. keep up for a second. Yeah. Um, you said if it were known for a place where you would really get caught for littering, would you see that as a positive? That would be a good draw? Or are you saying that that's a concern you would have, that people would stay away? The, the no, that people, the good people would come into town that knew that littering was bad. You know, you don't want to go to Brookfield if, you, if you're going to be littering, you know, I mean. Right. I mean, there are towns like that. I can't think of one offhand, but I mean, I know that they exist. I, I've, I've come to a town where, hey, want, don't do anything wrong in that town, or they'll get you, you know, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to attract the right kind of people. I think uh, if, you, if you take, like, the people that belong to the Autobahn and go to the other Autobahn sanctuaries, I mean, they're pretty good people. They're not going to litter and stuff, right. you know what I mean? We, right. I think the people that litter are crumb bums, to be honest with you, you know. It's usually during the night. I never see anybody throw anything out in front of my house during the day. I mean, but then, you know, you see a bottle and a can and all that. It's, it's, I think it's, I think it's like I said, I hate to call them crumb bums, but I mean, it's not, it's not quality people. And that's what we hope to attract if we ever try to market our open space with quality people coming into town. Right. That if they saw somebody littering, they would tell them, hey, you know, go ahead and pick that stuff back up. What do you think you're doing here? Right. So, how could the whole town become part of the sort of the picking up the, the anti-littering to making sure that it, it's contained, it's picked up, it's all those things because it does happen. And um, the, the survey we did, people mentioned a lot around the town beach that there's a lot more littering around there simply also because there's more people and it's um, picnic time and swimming time and all those things. So how could people get involved? Well, we have a weekend where you, where you go in front of your property and pick up your trash. So right. I, think, right. I think the good people in town are just going to have to continue doing right. their thing. So that should be extended <laughs> into the beach? to sort Maybe of we should have it twice a year. It's actually called Project Clean Sweep, it's run by Appleseed, a citizens group here in town, and it's not just for in front of your house, although that's a good starting point. The project asks that people coordinate and take care of as much of their area as possible, 
and volunteer if they have the time and the inclination to go to places like the beach that are not in direct line of their property and coordinate that way. And I believe on that day, the um, transfer station does not charge for any trash or litter that is delivered to them as a result of this effort. Clarence was nodding to that, but that's correct. Right. So yeah. Cindy was gracious enough to give us a bunch of orange bags, and those orange bags got distributed, and tons of stuff came in. Yeah. Were a lot of people involved? Yeah. yeah. And that's something the town can get behind? Yeah. But there is still a cost to the town. Oh, yeah. Of disposing? Yeah. 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 Um, well, and, and so I'll share my business side. So, so I own a farm on Gay Road um, from where uh, my clientele comes up uh, Gay Road, Cedar Street, Sturbridge, and we picked up the trash and three weeks ago when it was no snow on the ground, we picked it up and picked up three bags of trash between our house or our farm and, and this town line. So <clears throat> again, no, no cost to the town because I'm buying the bag and I'm putting it in, but I want my customers to see that what, that area of Wolf Swamp is in fact pristine. So I, I do it because it's a it's a business thing. Mm -hmm. We've heard through also some of the previous dialogues and also the survey that we did that it tends to be the same people who get involved, the same people who volunteer. Um, when you do a, a pick up in front of your own property or if it were to, is it the same, same people or is it easy to get other everybody involved? Mm, I'm sure a lot of people don't even go out and do in front of their property. So. Right. <laughs> Not a lot of people don't care. No, you're right. You're exactly it's right. It's an American way. Yeah, you're Go right. to Canada. How did the Canadians do it? Why is yeah. Canada so much cleaner than the United States? What's wrong with us? They're known to be nice, right? <laughs> different society. That's what I mean. What are we doing wrong, or what are they doing different that, yeah. that we as a, as a people don't do? They have strict rules. Maybe. It might be strict rules. But written nice. Then we need some strict rules. Mm -hmm. yeah. But could people live with that, with restrictions as, as in around littering, for example, that that may be fines? It's or hard to enforce that. It's hard to enforce. It's very hard to enforce that. Mm -hmm. But a, go ahead. There is an initiative petition being passed around town now okay. that will get to town meeting. Okay. It probably right. will not pass, but it will at least be on the floor. Okay. Because with that comes um, person resources, but also money resources. And is that something people could The thing is, there, there, there has to be a police officer standing right there when you throw it or camera. and be willing to do something about it. But it's, it would be, it take a lot to do that. I don't think that would work. That's, that's hmm? you tend to put it I don't think that would work. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. Because the cameras could be all out. kinds of ways. Yeah. In certain areas. We certainly have so many remote cameras now, you don't even have to wire them. Just... Oh, with our good, with our with that good lawyer system. With that cost. <clears throat> but would people be open to the, the town diverting more resources towards this? Is this something people could accept, that trade-off? They, they might have just presented correctly. Well, if it's a, it's intelligent plan, it makes sense. You know, it looks like it's, and there's some evidence that it would work. So, it has to be a real plan. <laughs> So evidence that in my work could look like what do other towns do where it's potentially and therefore see that it has, they've seen a change. Mm -hmm. um. If I could raise a, an issue that hasn't been raised, Brookfield is a bedroom community for reasons that have been gone into, not much local um, economic development. Um, a lot of people are busy raising families and or working or working out of their homes and they may own a large tract of land but they don't they don't really use it except as protection and privacy or in, in the case of public lands they don't have the time or the inclination or the means to spend time doing that or they're simply not outdoors type people so the question then becomes if this a first of three approaches. approaches is enacted, how many in town would benefit versus people who come here because of that? And that's the question I'd be interested in hearing some hard numbers on if it's possible to come up with them. Okay. Can so you repeat the second half? I, I got the, I got the <laughs> characterized. No, it's 
that Brookfield has a lot of commuters who, who use their property here as, as a quiet retreat, and then you ask the question. Or for privacy. And yeah, in, in the case of the public lands, um, you know, they don't they don't use their property for for anything else. They, you know, some people don't even take nature walks simply because they don't have the time or the means or they don't own that big piece of property. And in case of the public lands, either they don't have the time or the immunization, or they're simply not outdoors types. So the question then becomes, uh, who bono, who benefits um, in town versus outsiders. versus outsiders who may be attracted to Brookfield because of the, the land for sports and hunting and so forth. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's capture that and then um, I suggest we move on to the second approach. Yep. So if people click the page and then Sarah and I are going to switch off. So this one is the one that's called Promote and Enhance Accessibility and Public Safety at Brookfield's Natural and Recreation Areas. So uh, at, the conversation has already started to blend these approaches. That's perfectly understandable and natural. What uh, this approach really asks us to look at is for the open space plan to uh, place very high value on the ability to access and use Brookfield's natural areas and recreation areas conveniently and safely. The emphasis would be on improving the access the usability of it, that's the safety, the knowledge about what's there and what's allowable. Also expanding amenities, sidewalks, trails, connecting areas between um, recreation areas, uh, and try to enhance people's curiosity and desire to use the outdoor spaces in town. Uh, some of the actions that this pr approach may focus on would be to enhance the safety and physical access of the natural areas. Another set of actions would be around developing awareness of what's here um, and what's allowable on the lands. And then there would also possibly be an emphasis on creating new recreation areas or new ways of using the areas, um, new playgrounds, new sidewalks, et cetera. Um, some of the trade-offs that this approach may require um, are, again, that there may not be a lot of tax revenue generated from this approach, and it could be, uh, it would require a lot of resource. We've started to talk a little bit about that. It, it, there's a cost associated with these activities. Um, and they may impinge a little bit on, on the pristine character. So I'll give you a minute, like we did in the last approach, to put your own eyes on this one out on page three of four. It is approach two, but it's on page three of your guide. So read that through for about a minute, and then when people are ready, we'll talk about it. more time. So we'll open this one with the question, if the town prioritized more access and recreation in these ways, how might you personally benefit? Sure. Uh, uh, sidewalks, uh, just on some of the roads are tough right now to walk on. This is can be tricky getting from one part of town to the other. Um, you know, we're coming from the northern side of 148. When you get to the center of town, or close to the center of town, you hit sidewalks, so then it's fine, but 
getting through the causeways where the road thins out and there's no easy access. It, it just gets limits the ability to walk from place to place. And the same thing going on the causeway across the river, especially, that's a, a very tight squeeze um, getting from the north of the river to south of the river. Um, so there's, there's places that are tough to walk to. So it would, improving sidewalks or expanding the sidewalk network would be a benefit for myself and my family, for sure. It'd also be a huge challenge because you can't put sidewalks on the state land. And then you got, you got property where it's private property. How do you get the sidewalk on private property? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge challenge. I'm gonna say it's impossible. And sidewalks would be wonderful across the causeway. I agree with you, right? but how do you get the, how do you get the, uh, the uh, wildlife management people say that's a great idea. Let's do that. You're in charge of that committee. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else that wants to think about or, or talk about what, how they might personally benefit if there were an emphasis on more access to using the lands that are here? I can keep going. Let's see, let, we may come back to you. Let's okay. see if there's anyone else that wants to add. I've heard from people on Facebook, and I'm not going to say whether or not I agree with them, but there's been a lot of feedback on the various local Facebook pages about the lack of trails and how people feel that they would use the property, the public property, and uh, wildlife management areas if there were trails. And one of the concerns mentioned was uh, ticks. Um, another, you know, uh, uh, parasites that you could get walking through a non-trail area. Um, the possibility that if you're not, if you're not conversant with a compass, you might get lost. Um, that marked trails would basically increase use, make it safer for everybody, um, and make it more pleasant to use the outdoors. But we go to all this trouble of making everything nice. Is it only for Brookfield people? I mean, are our tax dollars going to work? And is it just for Brookfield people to be able to use these things? What do you think? Are, are, do you have a thought or an opinion about whether it should be? No, I don't. I don't. I just think that, I don't know where, where that came from, but it just, you know, I mean, you know, we go to all this trouble of doing this and, um, you know, then is it just ours, or is it, you know, is it everybody else's, you know, I mean, you know, she mentioned maybe a lot of people in Brookfield aren't using, you know, the, the areas because they're working and they don't, they don't have time, and most of the areas are being used by outsiders, so what do we do about that, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's an interesting thought, and I think we're going to come back and think a little bit more about if there's a way to get a benefit from mm -hmm. that when we talk about capturing tourist mm -hmm. dollars. Mm -hmm. But as of now, it sounds like you're expressing a little bit more as a concern mm -hmm. that you'd be spending the money for the amenities and not necessarily And, and you, you go there to walk on the trail and you don't know anybody there because nobody's from Brookfield. Yeah. You know? Maybe you and me, you know? That's yeah. about it, you know? Um, the beach of the year in the province. Correct. Do you want to say what you were thinking before? I think they hit with the trails is, is just another benefit that would be for us is more trails through. But the, the fish and game are really ones who are open to the trail idea. Yeah, wildlife, no. Yes. Conservation, yes. Yeah. So you got to be careful. If we were lucky enough to have some open space become available to us, mm -hmm. we need to be very careful because wildlife is certainly looking, and again, Bill explained that they want to do more on the river. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you go that way, it's, yes, that's for hunting and observing birds, but that's not for trails. Mm -hmm. So just on DFG land, as a Department of Fish well, and Game, sorry. I, I'd like yeah. trails everywhere we can get them. But yeah, especially. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, in fact, we probably should be doing something if we look, if we consider devil, devil's elbow and that pathway 
up to Foster Hill. Is Devil's Elbow the achieve? No. Well, well, portions of it, yes. Yeah, well, what is the, the trail that goes off of Devil's Elbow? Is that is that through Fish and Wildlife, though? Boy. Do we, can Look we at the map, it looks like. Yeah. Cause yeah. Is, that, is that Richardson, or is Where that? Where is Devil's Elbow? Uh, top, go, top. Go up, go up right 148, there. just before yeah, the town line. Yeah. At the end of that road. So the green is his. So this, it's a bunch of APR, but then it is wildlife. Yeah. Because there is a trail that goes there. there. There is a, yeah. Um, and there's a trailhead marker. Yes. That pins. So, Clarence, was this more trails on Devil's Elbow or two? We ought to look to promote if, if, we're gonna, if we were going to do something. More isn't trails there's, isn't on there a parking Devil's space down at the end of Devil's Elbow? For you to go on the trail? I don't yes, know. on the left hand side there is. Right, okay. Yeah. I usually come in from the other side, so I don't. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back to that math in a minute. Um, do people feel that the town should be uh, expending effort on um, more information about what is allowable and what is here through maps, websites, guides? I'd say definitely. I mean, I just picked up this. this Trail guide from Starbridge, it's excellent, you know what I mean? Yep. And uh, we don't we don't have much literature really available on anything like that. We'll have the Quay Park map on the twenty second. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Come on back. How do other people feel about whether that's a good use of, of effort, a good effort, a good use of resources? I think it's a good idea, but we like cost of it and the other people, a lot of, a lot of other people go outside, of, not say call them outsiders coming in, but I don't know where half the trails are in town. I would be. So would you personally benefit if there were? Yeah, I would personally benefit from it. But the cost, I mean, it's, now the Audubon and the wildlife, nobody funds any of that. The town, they do, to promote. Yeah, it's true. Personally, they don't. Right. So that should be something that should probably should be addressed. And maintaining the trails, who does that? You know, yeah. I know I've heard of somebody from Audubon supposedly working the trails and maintaining trails in the area, surrounding areas, but you don't see much of it. Yeah. So they do their own land, right? Some, we'd like to see some, some uh, money spent on yep. education like of, of private land by a private of the Audubon. So they they don't do materials at all? I thought they did. No, they do, but they don't. I mean, they're very sporadic. I mean, they, oh, okay. one day, you know, one 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 part of the year the trail is a mess. The other part of the year it might be, you know, they might come clean up once. Upkeep, then, not just education, upkeep. And then, like I say, I don't know where half the trails are. So well, this, uh, this Audubon land is kind of like on the back burner, actually. It's just kind of, it's, it's not considered like their other Sanctuaries. It's like just, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> Prince, Princeton, they're active. Yeah, Princeton's yeah. really good. Oh, yeah. They're not here. They're no. not really promoted by the Audubon. Kind of a low priority property. Is that because the town hasn't pushed the Audubon to do more? Or is there, what, what is the. What makes, what makes the Audubon active versus inactive? The only thing from a town perspective that I can tell you in my experience over the last three years is we pressed them to take advantage of the land to put it back into agriculture. So that there has been an active to grow what Mark's doing up there and others to be able to do that. Well, but as far as yeah. not. For them, it's an odd property because it's a mixture of APR and auto, Autobahn. And I think it's, it's it, that's not often the case with Autobahn. Right, so there. Yeah. So, I, in the previous couple of dialogues that we've had, we've had a representative here, Bill Davis, who's one of the um, administrators in the, at the Fish and Game, who manages the properties here in Brookfield, the, the four wildlife management areas. And um, the, the groups had the benefit of some information from him. He's not here tonight, but I just wanted to put a little bit of attention on the information that he shared so you can benefit from that as well. If you, if you look at your supplemental sheet, um, we didn't really, 
I guess on one on one side there's a title. So that if we consider that page one. If you flip it over to the back, the second heading says DFG land in Brookfield. And these bullets represent um, some of the key messages that he shared. And what, one of the key points was that the mission of wildlife management areas for that agency is really to protect the high quality habitat and the lands for the species that live there. And they manage them very actively for that. It's not a passive management. They, um, they call and protect and promote diversity in a number of very active ways. And their attitude towards trails um, is that that kind of concentrated use where you cut through and clear and um, have a lot of people using the exact same areas can really disrupt the wildlife and break up the habitat and degrade it. And at the same time, you know, just people walking through it to hunt or track or do nature photography doesn't disrupt that at all. And so they make a pretty uh, clear distinction under their mission for the purposes that they manage these lands that says, you know, active trail building where there's not already a trail is strongly discouraged and they generally don't do it but they do welcome people using their lands. And that was something that came as a surprise to a lot of the other groups. They didn't even know they were necessarily allowed on the land. Um, but he, did, he gave a good explanation of, of why they discourage trails. And, and it really, uh, from their expertise, from their perspective, it really disrupts their, the habitats and the ecosystems they're trying to protect. So that being said, um, I guess a question to consider is how you all feel about that trade-off. Do, do you still feel that um, with, with kind of understanding it from his perspective and from the agency's perspective, how would you feel about really trying to push for trails on these lands um, if, they were, if you were to come to a compromise or have some dialogue about it? Is it do you, are you also concerned about the pristine nature of these habitats, or is that l less important to you than the ability to get out there and not get ticks and not get lost and actually enjoy the land? I'm ready. The wildlife area along with the Dog River, which is part of the area we were talking about, which needs a trail or a sidewalk is definitely not a pristine habitat. Um, and I really feel like two-thirds of the population in the town of Brookfield lives south of that Quaybog River. And it would be really helpful to have some sort of a walking trail, even if it's along the edge of Mass Wildlife's property. So can you show me what you're talking about? Fish and wildlife ones. <coughs> Both sides. Along, 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 along 148. Along one, Route 148. So in order to have a walking trail from the south side of the river, we have to cross Fish and Wildlife Park. I'm wondering though if that would be a mass highway issue, wouldn't it? If we wanted to put a sidewalk in there or have one put in eventually? Because they city's, city's probably the person to ask. Yeah, but they, they must own the the highway must own you know so many feet away from the road, don't they? Not in that area. No, are you kidding me? It's amazing. You know where my property is? Yeah. On the street. Wow, that's something. On the street. The town never and this goes back years ago, the town never did what the state offered them the opportunity to do. Hmm own the right-of-ways on all of these Amazing. roads. Yeah. Brookfield did not participate in the program. Wow. Therefore, they do not own hmm. all of the land that some people think they do. So, yeah. so one of the things we're supposed to be capturing is, is further questions that right. need to be explored. So some coordination with DFG about sidewalk safety and access along 148. Some dialogue there sounds like it's really in order. We've heard that actually a couple times tonight, and we've heard that in some of the other dialogues. So on the flip meeting. side, that's why I asked Cindy to point First that out. Meeting. First meeting. First meeting and the yeah. second. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. second. Yeah. So just so everybody knows, there's going to be a cutting plan in this corner here. And what I suggested to Bill when we, we talked about it, or what I understood that, is that one of the things, if they do a cutting plan here, is to in fact use the tow roads as 
a way to uh, provide access. So they at least you start off with a trail. Where was this? Sorry, I couldn't see you. Oh, sorry, I wasn't going. This corner, they're going to be. There's going to be a cutting. Oh, okay. How are they get in there? But that doesn't help us with access from south. No. no, that's why I was wondering what you were So another question is, um, how do you feel about the town using its resources towards some of these amenities, some of the improved upkeep, maybe some of the new, um, some building some new amenities that we've talked about? Uh, we, we had, you, you spoke to that a little bit, you said if the town puts the money in and it's really out of towners that get all the benefit, you, you have some concerns about that. Um, what, what are some of the other thoughts about if that's a good use of town resources? I don't believe you could convince the town to spend the money. You can what, sorry? I don't believe you could convince the town to spend the money, really. And I agree with you, you never get up to town meeting. Well, I mean, we're going to be getting grants. Yeah, that's an alternative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it depends on how much it costs. <laughs> so, so that's, it. that's an interesting question. If, if you could get a grant that required a local match, so you're using local dollars <coughs> to leverage state dollars, does that make it more appealing? Well, we have to be realistic. We may all say yes, but we're a small portion of the town. All the people that have no interest in this are going to vote no. So that's, that's very helpful to know. And we ask people to put their, their selves in, in some people who are not represented here in the room. But I, I also want to know how you feel. So how do people feel in this room? He says, if you all say yes, do you personally say yes? If the town has the money, sure. And Jim's going to vote no. So yeah, we I mean, I, I personally think the town really needs sewer. But I wouldn't vote for it unless the state gave us like 95%. And that's what's, as far as I'm concerned, the town really needs sewer and water outside the village. Yep, yeah, but then you create well, all really kinds of other problems. We don't have sewer. We don't have sewer up here. I mean, no, we don't have sewer. That's right. We've missed many opportunities to get it, though. Any final thoughts on this approach? Fisheries and wildlife aside, <clears throat> and we've already gone over some of the issues associated with developing the use of those areas, I'd like to see Brookfield improve what they have already. I think that would be the best use of our resources. Improve what we have, and then if we have any excess revenue or excess enthusiasm, then we could look upon expanding what we might not have. Um, either by encouraging private donation of land for open space or encouraging people who own large tracts of land to keep them pristine and keep them clean and to <coughs> take some pride in their own property. You know that? Mm -hmm. okay. So pride and property, right, so to speak. And then also you were saying, so improve what we're all in hand, spend resources on this. And then you were saying something about if there's additional funds. If there's additional funds or enthusiasm or opportunity, then look beyond what we have and uh, develop in the holistic sense over and above what we already have. Then, then expand. Yeah. Improve what here, and expand with the extra. Yeah. And, and otherwise, pri prioritize starting with what we have now. Yeah. yeah. But and to fix what we have now, there's, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed all yeah, along. I, I agree. With you. There's a lot of yeah. stuff that has to be fixed in the town area. We, we could use a lot of sprucing up in many ways. Mm -hmm. and I personally think there'd be more support for doing something for Lewis Field than there would be for any of these other projects myself. Yeah. And, and last. The last meeting was the Lewis Field was well represented in the last meeting. Yeah. Um, enhance Lewis Field. Thank you. I couldn't hear it from yep. there. And there may be an opportunity, for example, to partner with in town organizations like the Historical Society to make information available about some of these open spaces. Um, you know, there may be monuments such as the Adena site that we've been concentrating a lot of attention on. There may be other 
um, less well-known sites in town, either on public or private property, that could benefit from signage, uh, resources from the Historical Commission, um, and so on. So tours as well? Did I hear you say tours? Do tours? Uh, well, no, but that's oh, always a possibility. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I heard tours. Sorry. 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 I got the signage, but sometimes my ears are this way. It's hard and then to hear. So Independent laugh. <laughs> <laughs> this man. So we'll yep. put a commercial in back, back to the Adina site. Is that we have three buildings that need to come down. It is a burial site. There's no question. All right. So, as a timekeeper, I'm going to move you to approach three. Yep. So you can go to the last page on that. So, sustain. This is called sustained workers' long-term viability as a place to work and thrive. So this one places high value on the economic viability of the community, especially jobs, tax revenue, and sustainability of farming as a way of life. The emphasis is on activities that generate revenue streams for land management and upkeep, actions that provide jobs for residents, enhancing the tax base for the town as a whole, and leveraging the town's open space to enhance economic activity through increased tourism opportunities. And some of the potential actions to consider are plan comprehensively to keep Brookfield economically sustainable and desirable. Expand community events and recreation opportunities that generate revenue. Enhance the viability of farms and farming. And diversify town revenue sources. Some of the trade-offs um, to consider are doing these things might change the community's small time character. Um, a loss of the peacefulness and quietness of town. Threats to the natural habitat and the environment. And Increase in traffic and congestion, narrow streets for access, insufficient parking, and the potential for increased littering and need for more trash removal services. So, if you could just take a quick minute to sort of look at the potential example, no, uh, the examples under each of the the actions, just so you get a sense of the breadth of what some of the things we're talking <coughs> about here. People need more time. So, similar to question that we've started each of them was, so if the town were to prioritize economic development, <coughs> tourism, and actions to promote farming and farm products, what would some of the benefits be? We're going to keep farms viable. Keep farms viable. Well, yeah. Otherwise, we're going to have housing developments. And we don't want that problem. We can't afford that problem. I'm not sure we can afford farms either, Karen. So, during that economic. Well, fortunately, we can afford the farms. Well, as long as you can make a business out of it. There you go. You see that again? I missed it. I. You were sort of yeah. He was challenging. We're, oh. we're challenging one another. Okay. Yeah. So Trying to get the dialogue going. Yeah. <laughs> well, then we should get more. Farms are self-sustaining businesses, not dependent upon taxpayer support. Yeah, exactly. Good. Fortunately, we have someone who's very much a viable business. In fact, building a barn last year. Yeah. Fantastic. No, you can, you can farm successfully here, but you know, I, from my standpoint, a lot of the people that 
support I find don't live in this town. <laughs> to be honest with you. So <laughs> we like to keep our trash picked up. So but that it would want to come to. But town. it would be nice if more people in town would support the farms that are in this town because I think we could have a heck of a heck of a lot more successful farms in town if they did. But. I think it goes with this whole discussion we're having. I don't know how many people really appreciate the open space we have in this town, no matter what the use it is, that live in the town. Yeah, but see, one of those fundamental, but we don't have a supermarket in town that can buy local products. So, I mean, mm. you have a problem, you have no economic development, you don't have anything. Yeah. So, so, so going, but maybe it's we go next, next, Yeah, but we go next door, and we have a supermarket that does, in fact, take our stuff. We, in fact, have two supermarkets. Yeah, they don't sit here, but they take our stuff. So but they're not in town, Clarence. If I may, I agree. If I may, hang on. What kind of support would be good? What would that look like when you say support of farms and farming? Well, no, you'd have to have more local people willing to stop at the farms, because then I think there could be a lot more farms here, but most people don't. You stop agree with that? that so you agree with that, too, Bill? Are you, you agree with that, Bill? Yeah. yeah. Buy local doesn't live in this town. No, no, you're right. Okay. So no. buy local, yeah. Does not live in this town. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> yeah, we tried the farmer's market several times and... <laughs> Brooke feels that people just stopped coming out interested. Maybe you should form a yeah. farmer's co-op and be like Atkins Farms out in Dilbert's Place out of 148 where people come as a destination to buy fresh products. Well, Clarence thought about doing that. Yeah, that's what we're done because that was an, an idea that we should get on board. Right. Yep. Yep, so let's just make sure we find an entrepreneur But it might, might not fly here because we have a different clientele than they do in Amherst. All right, so, so let's back up so we get the idea because... Um, it wasn't that way when I... Grew all right, hang on, hang on, hang on. We, we have to catch up, otherwise we're not ca capturing what's being said. And part of it, when Sarah's doing this, when he's talking and then... So, if you could repeat your well, idea. My, uh, my idea was have a farmer's co-op for a place like Atkins originally started as a market to sell things like apples and stuff. They've since expanded way beyond what they were. But it was basically a place where people could come and open normal business hours like a supermarket to sell local products. Right. And you were mentioning 148? Well, like 148 would be the logical place to do it or would yep. die. Or then. Yeah. Okay. And then any you had a concern on that or a counter on no, that? No, no. I just, yeah, maybe maybe on Route 9 and we, we would fly. But, I mean, we have a different type of clientele generally in this whole area than they have, like, in Amherst. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, but <laughs> you, you look at the success of uh, Rudy's place, you have that clientele here. Well, perhaps. If, if you built the brand, people mm. wanted to come from Yeah. Yeah, you got to go upscale. I think all, that, all those that, upscale people in Sturridge are coming rather than big bucks. Yeah. No, there's a lot of people that come to my farm from Sturridge, actually. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some other benefits on, on this approach? Sort of there's expanding community events or some of the other actions um, to get more recreation to generate revenue. Um, diversify the town uh, revenue sources by selling, for example, the Cooley Hill Reservoir, or creating additional solar farms, or other ways. Yeah. So Cooley Hill's moving in a direction, hopefully will be, will be sold. Flip, flip it around, uh, the second thing that you Solar farms? Solar farms. Yeah. They don't do anything for anybody but the person who owns a solar farm. Right. Okay. They don't do anything for the town. Mm -hmm. You're a bit of an eyesore, too. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> More than once. It depends on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But some of these ideas are also won't necessarily just benefit the entire town, but also the people who live here who can actually, so it's a, they can viably live here and work here and thrive. Um, so there's sort of both of that. There's, um, so there's both bringing people who pass by to come in here, maybe have, you, have, you could do a lot of agricultural tourism, for example, and, and have education around farming and farms, or have tours of farms, which I don't know if you're doing anything like that. Yeah, we do things that, yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then of course selling farm products, um, expanding on events to both offer more opportunities for oneself to 
have fun and do stuff yourself, but also invite people in. Is that things that sh are beneficial to, it to could, pursue? It could be. If you go to Italy, they have these agriturismos, which they encourage people to stay. Um, our zoning would not per permit that sort of thing. People would actually stay there as like a bed yeah. and breakfast yeah. farming yeah. experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, are you proposing that that could be addressed through the zoning reform? It would need yeah. zoning reform to be able to do that. Yeah. Do people sort of work as well while they are staying there? That's part of the. That's part, part of the deal, or yeah. it's just just be yeah. there because of the trusting yeah. nature of the yeah. facility. If I could address the zoning issue, I'm chair of the zoning of the planning board, and CMRPC is currently helping us review our zoning bylaws. And one of the things we're looking at is maybe changing some of the zoning districts to both enhance economic development, open up some places that are currently only zoned rural residential in areas that are logical to do so, while encouraging things like cluster development, which would leave a lot more open space and you would not have um, you would not have these large minimum lot sizes. So that people would get a greater sense of community because they'd be living a little closer together while still having the benefits of open <coughs> space that is available to all. And that would also create opportunities for businesses, for um, a possibly in the future sewer or water because you're, it's less expensive to do so when the homes are closer together. And also to allow individual businesses that don't that aren't currently allowed such as you know um, residential bed and breakfast slash farms so we're looking at that right now so this is an important piece of it which is one of the reasons i wanted to tape it all right so let's make sure that what we captured is what you were saying um thank you because i think i'm again yeah. i'm gonna sum yeah. it sort of under the idea of of promoting a stay work visit option on farms that would require zoning reform. You said that the town is currently looking at zoning reform to promote cluster development and corresponding open space protection and more businesses. More concentrated business zones to encourage more sane use of what we have without, without sprawl happening. I guess that's what we're looking for. The concern I have with cluster development is the impact on the aquifer. It says if you, that's, a, that's a real concern. And without doing a scientific study, which I don't want to spend quarter we, million dollars. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with how we work on the, on the planning board, but any development of any kind has to be looked at in detail by the town's engineering consultant. So those things are addressed as part of that process. But we from when we had the, we're almost got a lawsuit down a little swamp. Well, that, was 40, done aquifer stuff. that was 40B. That's a different animal yeah, altogether. Again, yeah, had we done the court, we would have had to done an aquifer study. It's done. still 40B. I'm talking about your normal 40A type development. And I'm talking about concerns about aquifer. Which are addressed under 40A. All right, hang on. I'm sorry. We, yeah, we need to come back. Um, planning for commercial development um, depends on identifying suitable areas. Are there locations um, where you think the community would be willing to see that happen? What kind of commercial development? That can be anything that you think might be needed. And it could be that the conversation could be on that, that if it's so-and-so, this might be a good place. Or if it's so-and-so, this is definitely not a good place. And it's not that we have an agenda in mind, we're simply collecting ideas. See, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't think Brookfield has the kind of land that you'll ever see an industrial park or anything like that go in, because we just don't have that kind of land. So what so about on a smaller scale? That said, in 1910, if you look at photographs of this town, there is oh, a tremendous commercial In the center, right? Right out here. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah. What about on a smaller yeah. level versus industrial? Which That's when the town was thriving, to. right? Yeah. It was thriving. I know. In 1860, was driving. Yeah. Personally, I, th I think with um, I think with the advent of the internet and the interconnectivity of businesses that don't require a physical presence, there may be opportunity for businesses that wouldn't otherwise thrive because of logistics. For example, um, small clusters of 
retail and service businesses, not industrial parks, but uh, clusters near the center of town, for example. Mm -hmm. There are some properties in town which are not currently in, in use, in use or, or having their best use. Those might eminently at some point in the future be developable into areas that would encourage small business people to come in to the center, the population center of the town, and once again, make it a walkable business district. Okay. So around town square? Uh, yes. Center town, yeah. And that's come up in the earlier meetings. Right. The other areas I'm thinking of from the standpoint of the planning board is along the main thoroughfares, 148, Route 9, and those two being the most obvious, but okay. there may be other streets that, you know, lend themselves well. Exactly. Yeah. So how do people feel about that? If those areas were to be sort of corridors or clustered areas of business, do people have beneficial something to be, or would that help? Do people have concerns on that? Or it would be better if we could. I can, I can name a concern, which has come up, and that would be increased traffic and increased the proliferation of parking lots. And with the proper type of planning, the proper type of design, those concerns can be addressed. Okay. If the town again prioritize these actions here, do people have other concerns that they would like to voice that haven't surfaced yet? I think we're running out of gas. That's all right. It is also evening. Yeah. Um, it's actually very lively still. Impressed. Yeah. <laughs> we are good. Yeah. Doing great. Yeah. So, one, okay, so final question. Um, should the town spend money on, for example, new tourist attractions and marketing campaigns to get people in here to spend money, um, even if there are no guarantees about the amount of revenue that it would generate? Would that be something to consider? We haven't talked a lot about the tourist attractions, but that's come up in some of the other ones too. And a lot of the ideas are, are listed here that people talked about as well. So how's your CSA doing? Well, no, I was just going to say, I think if you don't market yourself as a business or a town or whatever, you're never going to be able to spruce up your property. Look, look at the town as a property, okay? If we don't market this town as being something special, then it's never going to, it's never going to, it's never going to come out of its doldrums right. that it's slipped into. So somehow it's going to have to be marketed as something special in some way. If it's just these open space areas that say, hey, Brookfield's kind of a special town, maybe I consider relocating that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, maybe in time some of these houses in the center of town, I, I always envisioned that, you know, that the center of town here could really look really beautiful again one day. But it's not going to be, it's not going to happen if the town's not marketed as something special, a place where people might really want to live. Right. Right. Do other people, how do people feel about that? Do they agree? I see some nodding. Yeah. So Mark, I was going to add back to CSA because that's truly marketing. Yeah, the CSA, in which you have a farm, the CSA is probably one of the best things you can do, in my opinion. So CSA is at the share? Community supported yeah. agriculture, yeah. yeah. So you're doing because So we have a question on what that is? Because you, then you're going to get the people that are really interested in supporting local agriculture, you see. They're going to join your CSA. Are you can seeing? you say, because we had a question what that was, what that entailed? Community supported agriculture. But you have to do, you have to do your marketing. I thank my sister for that because she does all the marketing. I mean, you have to have a good website or a computer. So you said yeah. that's the process where people yeah. will buy a yeah. share. I buy a share, share. yeah, ahead of time. And then they get a box of vegetables. Yeah. Um, you have to have brochures, you have to have signage. We have signage up right now down on uh, Route 20 in Sturbridge. Right. We have to join the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, you know, all these kind of things. These are all necessary. So. But you've seen growth. Oh yeah. 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 
I mean, farms are a lot of work. <laughs> it's not like, it's not like, uh, you know. Yeah, they're a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. The boots are still wet. That's right. Yeah. It's not. It's not like uh, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna tell you that that you know. You know, it's the greatest thing in the whole world. But I mean, to me, it is because I I've always been involved in local agriculture and like to see it at least last around here and not just keep on folding, which it seems to be all the time. Right. So. If you could educate the public to understand farming a little better. I think you're exactly right. A lot of it's education. You know, yeah. farming is not a machine. If you need 10 more, you can't walk up and push the button and run out 10 more. You know, it takes six, eight months, maybe a year to oh, get yeah. things, you know? Well, it takes a lifetime, let's face it. Well, people don't understand that, know. that it takes a long time to get... Yeah. Yeah. And especially in New England, it's had because of our climate. Things aren't always going to be the same every day. I mean, California, where the weather is pretty consistent and everything's irrigated, I mean, you know, things are different there than here. We have a harsh environment, actually. Hey, California's got its faults. No, they yeah. do too. Yeah, they have water <laughs> Drought, yeah. All right, so how about we wrap up this approach and move into just spending a little bit of time talking about what we've heard today and what we call reflections. Now we're zooming back out, looking across all of the approaches in the entire discussion tonight. Think about if there's an area of general agreement you think you heard tonight. And speak about it. Think about it and let us know. I just think that Brookfield is a very unique town and that uh, it, it, it's probably, been, I, you know, I think, I think people don't really appreciate it for what it is actually. I guess that's my final statement and what it has to offer people. It truly is the last Green Valley. Yeah, it really is. If you think about it. So what were some themes that, that came out of tonight's discussion um, to, to capitalize on that or preserve that or enhance that? Communication. Say a little bit more. In increased communication uh, in, about, in, about what we have, about what the potential is, about opportunities to participate. I would make that communication slash education. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, education as well? Yep, communication yeah. and education on the same themes. Yep. You want more? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I'm ready. I can hear. None of us like trash. <laughs> None of us like trash. None of you like trash, but there did seem to be a general concern that it would be pretty hard to devote town mm. resources behind dealing with it. It's it's just it's like a. Is that because well, of the money involved? No, I just people's. Again, you guys joked about Canada and whatnot earlier. I mean, there is a mentality that tra throwing trash out your window is not an appropriate thing. Tell them how you raise. Tell them how you raise. I don't know so, that's all, all these people that live here in this town. The people no, that have gone so around here. I have property down on Route 9. No house or anything down there. It's just a basic piece of property. And that every year is totally trashed. And same thing with the piece I had down on Mill Street. No house or anything down there. But people just going through town. Just throw it out the window. It's, and it's, not, it's everything, anything. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. It's not just alcohol. Kind of is like um, McDonald's, McDonald's, anything you can think Dunkin of. Donuts. Oh, 
you, you guys all see the trash that's out there. We don't even have McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts in town. So you know it's coming from elsewhere of people going through or towns people that don't have an appreciation for it. Are there, um, there was one idea for addressing this, which was to maybe have more than the one day that there is of kind of the town cleanup day sponsored by, by Appleseed, right? Yes. Um, so there was one idea. Are there any other ideas? This, this is clearly a really challenging problem. Are there any other thoughts about how it could be addressed? More than one day for that. It's still the same group of people that are out there. Yeah, it's getting, that, that, it's getting that everybody doing, involved. Everybody you know, involved. It's trying to get everybody not just, involved. Not just on those days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a continual thing. You take a day a month and go out there and do it. Probably just something in the citizen every month saying, you know, why don't you get out there and clean the trash up in front of your house and maybe a mile on each side or something may help. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going to happen, but <laughs> I mean, I do that personally myself. I, I go out there several times a year and pick up the trash. I mean, I just don't like to see my uh, my front of my place being trashy and up and down Long Hill Road. I mean, right. has there been uh, it's pride, pride of your of your town and your property? Right. Yeah. So so. Any other ideas? So that was, that was another idea to promote it very regularly in the citizen. Um, for the thorniest problems that everyone agrees are a problem, it's probably worth some good brainstorming, so that's why I'm probing here. But. I'm gonna say something very controversial. I agree that enforcing littering is probably unrealistic given the size of the community and the number of roads we have as far as fines and police or other constabulary enforcement scope. But I would like to see a stronger approach toward discouraging or outlawing dumping, be it on somebody else's property, like the tires that were found a wolf, wolf swamp, so, or, yeah. or dumping on one's own property, turning it into a junkyard. I would like to see some sort of enforcement codified in the town bylaws about that. And I say that as somebody whose job as an elected official is to balance public and private interests. I think the other thing too is, you know, we got some pretty decent uh, schools here in town. The elementary schools are very good in Tantasco. Maybe we don't do enough through the schools to educate, educate the school uh, pupils as to, uh, you know, as far as uh, failings, you know, everything we discussed tonight, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I kind of speak for myself. I know when that original question here came out, I mean, basically we have nature's classroom right out the doors here, but do, but do, uh, is it really utilized by our schools? No. You know, could it be? Probably. Probably not, because it's not in the state curriculum. <laughs> no, I know what you mean, it's not in the state curriculum, well, but, right? But again, we should... Pat the Boy Scouts on the back because they put the trail back. Oh yeah, you're right. Back behind the school, and I so agree. it's there and it's yeah. available. Uh, we found that there, there's on Boyd's Ave a, a lot of land that was donated to the Boy Scouts back in 1959 for use, and now that the troop is back and active, I mean, we're talking 50 boys now. Where two years ago we weren't. Hmm. So uh, we, we've done <coughs> some nice things. That's great. Yeah. I want to say that they have. I haven't been back there, but they, they were spoke. The monies were available to, for the signage. Sure, black, 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 so, so they got up there. Yeah, the I knew the money was there. Yeah, but I didn't go very far into the trail. I knew it was the beginning of the trail. I didn't go there. I'm sorry. I, I'm not. So I got that there was a plot of land that Boy Scouts have been used now. Yeah, okay, so, a trail. so behind the elementary school, the Boy Scouts rejuvenated a trail. So they build a trail. Okay, yeah, and, it, and the signage is there now. I knew the money was there. I didn't know that the signs were up. So that's happened. And then what, what came to be known, because the scouts were reinvigorated, is that there's a plot of land on Boys Ave that was given to the scouts. It now has to be held by the town because the scouts can't hold property anymore. But anyway, that's a whole other problem. But, but there is a spot of land for youth activities to be in the outdoors on a plot of land that's available. So 
Were there areas where you definitely heard disagreement tonight? That's going to be the challenge of town. Who's going to pay? Hmm? Yeah. Who's going to pay? Yeah. Hopefully, I have a friend in our back here that uh, would have some grant monies that might be available. We just got to figure out how. And then some folks in Worcester that might help us navigate. I see some controversy in the role of fisheries and wildlife in the uh, economic and day-to-day uh, -day life of the town. Uh, trails being a flashpoint in particular. I think I'll make a suggestion. When I get, get, have the legislature file a special bill they can override them. I need to, I'm sorry, hang on. So, so the I, one, I one was who's going to pay for any, right. any of them? It's yeah. a question. And, getting, then, and then there was some controversy around the DFG lands. Same thing we've heard before right. that, that they're and trails. Their, their attitude towards usage in trails is a concern for a lot of people. All right. And then you were over here saying? Well, I mean, I, you can override them to enact the legislature. In fact, the town could, could petition their state reps to file a bill. So, so that's a, that's a, to address the concern of DFG. Yeah, and, and the so suggestion a, to use the legislature. To but that's a last the resort. Right. We can't. But there's a balancing, and just back to what Bill shared with us, that there is an endangered species on Quaybog River. Again, you, you would, as Bill explained it to us, you'd hear the bird, but you wouldn't see them because they're endangered and whatever. But so that there's this loose tight thing that we've got to figure out if we were to pursue trailage. But maybe the, the middle ground is, as they do their cutting program over on the western side, that if they put a trail in, a, a, a tow road in, if that could be the trail, at least we'd have something. Which comes back to another area I've heard agreement on, which is um, conversations with DFG about certainly access across the river, access to their lands to facilitate crossing the river, and um, maybe maybe use their, their cutting, their upcoming cutting, as an opportunity to get a little more recreation in there. And are there issues that came that you heard that you feel we still you still as a community need to work through? Um, some of the challenges, we've touched on some of them, the challenges of who's going to pay. Um, who are the beneficiaries? Who are the beneficiaries? Some questions about who pays and who benefits. Also the chicken and egg issue. How do we get started? Do we need to put up the money first? Or do we start with the most economically viable things and hope that they pay for the rest? Get that meta? Go for economic development first or we'll upgrade what we have already. You, you pay, clean do, up do you clean already. it up and hope that it pays for itself? It's not economic development. I think she's talking about devoting the resources to what's here in the hope that it pays for itself. Or do we prime the pump with town or state money or grants? And right. or get the money first. It, yeah, you prime the pump with state dollars first. Prime the pump? Prime the pump. Well, I think whatever we do, if it doesn't benefit the townspeople and the town, we're better to do nothing. <laughs> I mean, in reality. In some way, in the end, it has to benefit the town. You know, to expend any money if it's not going to benefit the town isn't worth it, is it? Well, it might be worth it in a larger sense, but it would be yeah. a hard sell. No, I know. But you, I, I'm not saying even if it would benefit the town in 10 years, fine, but if it's never going to benefit the town, then it's probably not worth doing it. Listen, putting in sewer years ago would benefit the town. They didn't sell it. Get the money hmm. first. Or, right. yeah. Yeah. Money. That's first. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so final question, and we're just going to leave you the last few minutes for the questionnaire so we can get you out of here by uh, 8.30. But a final question. Um, are you thinking about this issue differently than before this discussion began tonight? Is there anything that you feel you've shifted your perspective on or are thinking about differently? I 
I've heard some concerns that I've never thought of before <coughs> in general. Anybody else? And I lied, there is one final question. Are there perspectives that weren't in the room tonight that you think might have changed this conversation? targeted three different or four groups but we had to cancel one because of the storm but we had the seniors um, we had the rec group targeted for this the second session this was the egg uh, session so again we've almost on purpose segregated by but not by maliciously doing that. It was just a, a way to get groups together that would be able to piggyback on one another. So we have had inputs from others. Right. Any final thoughts before we ask you to fill out the questionnaire? The questionnaire will kind of be your final thoughts on a lot of these individual questions. And I thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. So we have pencils and uh, pens up there for the questionnaires and just pass them on. Drop them on. They're, they're anonymous. Yeah. Um, yep. So feel free to <coughs> drop them in a pile in the middle of the room. Thank you all for coming. And, and as a reminder, the next step, you know, this final report will be delivered to the town and to the regional planning agency. I imagine that you'll probably publicize it. We also will post it on, on the states on our website. And then from there, it becomes the foundation of the state's open space, of the town's open space recreation plan. And you'll hear about that in the coming months and the opportunities to get involved with the very specific recommendations of that plan through that process. And bees next month, same time, same place. Bees. <laughs> bees. 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 Bees.